You know, when I was putting some thoughts together about uh, today and this whole week, a, a number kept popping in my head. RA 1884-6904. And it was interesting in the fact that why my head kept going back to that. And I think it is because it's kind of a major dividing line, the end of a, maybe from part one to part two in a book or something to that effect. Because up until that point, I had been a student, you know, a kid on the block. I had uh, had the opportunity to live in a, a neighborhood where most of the adult males and some, even some of the one, several of the mothers had actually been nurses in the Second World War. So, and then, of course, my good dear friend, uh, who I still think almost seventy years after his passing, Mr. Klepper. And I, and sir, I appreciate you. You mentioned the gentleman. He was, in fact, a little interesting fact about him. When he returned from the trenches of the First World War, he. His first job was selling buggy whips and horse tack. <laughs> and he went on to sell a lot of things in his lifetime. And he was a humble man. And he always took time to talk to that little kid on the block. And it's amazing sometimes the people that cross your lives that get you a certain point. I remember Mrs. Clark, my fourth grade teacher, God bless her, she, she gave me the love of reading. And then there was Mrs. Smith who pounded the idea that you got to use proper grammar, not only in what you write, but what you speak. Mr. Sam Perry, a junior high school teacher, introduced me to the idea of, and the love of history. And Mr. Thomas, a high school teacher, he, he d took that further in the fact that he developed a sense of not only history, but the idea of American history. And the more I read and talked to people who had participated in places like Guadalcanal, Monday, Tarawa, and Normandy, it, it gave me a really a privileged sense that, man, I, I've met these giants, these heroes. At least they were my heroes. And then that number was given to me by a sergeant on, uh, at the AFI station there in Los Angeles. And it's the first, my first experience where he said that uh, by the time you get off this bus, and I'm sure it wasn't as calm and collected as that, <laughs> um, that number, beginning with RA, should be embedded in the back of your eyeballs or something to that effect. And so that began a journey that lasted almost 20 years on April 4th, 1967. I credit how I got to 11 September 1970, not so much to my doing, but those drill sergeants I had at basic training, AIT, the instructors I had for so many months in special forces training, and then the opportunity to be part of the 7th Special Forces Group for a while where we trained and trained and trained. I thought, my God, that's all we do is train. And then I went to Thailand, and not only did we train, but then we became instructors for the Thai Army, and later I worked at the Thai National Police Force where we developed a uh, basic medical training course for the uh, Thai police, the Tamils as they called them. And all that gave me the skills and the knowledge and the purpose of why I was there. And you get a sense of, of accomplishment when you, when you can walk away from an assignment and know that that school was done and there were young Thais that are going to go out there and they're going to act as medics and they're going to help. Because Thailand at the time in the north and the south was just being ravaged by well, in the north, supposedly communists, and they called them that in the south, but 
to be honest with you, I think we find they were really just pirates because they had been doing that for five or 600 years. But the 46 company trained them and trained them well in the Thai police force. And it just wasn't me, but it's all the people that have been involved in training, not only the individuals, but the units and the people that provide the equipment and the materials on a continuous basis. And then the idea I've always considered a very great privilege just to be a member of the United States Army and to be even part of Special Forces is a privilege that if I had walked away with at the end of my three or four years with a National Defense Ribbon and a Good Conduct Medal, I would have been the proudest young man that could be. And I've always felt that I've been oh, way over recognized for just doing what I think that I owed to my fellows in my unit. And then you come back to that mission, those four days. It's not just me, but my fellows in B Company, but those Air Force crews and those Marine Corps crews that were returning, they were going back to their unit, rearming, refueling, getting out to do their business and take a sandwich and a cup of coffee and get back in there and fly those crates that were so full of holes that uh, I'm surprised the aerodynamics alone would have kept them on the ground. And then when I left Vietnam and I continue to serve, run into veterans of the Vietnam War, most of us were. My good friend who is sitting out here, Don Williams, who served two tours, Charlie model gunships, and a Cobra pilot. And you, you get to serve with these men, and you serve, and you get that idea of service, and the idea of continuing to be things that make not the whole country or the state you live in or the base you live in, because you can't fix it as an individual. But you can go out and take all that stuff that the Army has taught you, all that stuff by just good association with good, decent people, and you can help fix your neighborhood and your little local community. And when you do that, you make the, the city a little better, the state a little better, and the country a little better. And when I look out here with all these uniforms and all these old, <laughs> I guess we're, I guess the word old and veteran could be applied, I guess, to most of us, or many of us here. And it, it does my heart good to see so many of you young people, and I, no offense, sir, but <laughs> you are. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, even the uh, the secretaries <laughs> and those people sitting here with four stars on their shoulder are, are somewhat youngsters. <laughs> <laughs> so, but the thing is that this this institution here and the in, the locations we have around the world they function and they function well, and it is a legacy that I'm proud of in the fact that we the Vietnam veteran had a hand in. And I am so grateful that all of you sitting here today continue to carry on that legacy that we have a piece of paper called the Constitution of the United States. And I, when I go out and I talk to children, I talk in reference to the fact that you have a Constitution that's 230 years old. It's a piece of paper and it and a piece of paper can be shredded or burnt. But because of the people that are sitting here in this room now, and those of us who served earlier, that piece of paper is going to be here for me and my grandchildren, and hopefully my great, great, great grandchildren. And it all goes back to one thing, the courage 
of a bunch of people, men and women, who regardless of the consequences or what they face, are going to do it because they know there is a better, better world out there as long as they keep on going down the road. And I would like to thank all of you active duty members for all the things that you do for this country today. And I know that uh, you deserve every credit and every accolade that you come about. So with that, I think I have exhausted my time here at this podium. And again, sir, Mr. secretaries and Sergeant Major, I, uh, with that, we'll say thank you and have a good day.